Amen. I've experienced a wide range of Christian communities during my many years of education and formation, which began at Virginia Theological Seminary, continued at Emanuel Church on the Hill in Alexandria as their associate rector, and since as a free range priest offering soft supply and sabbatical coverage for my clergy colleagues between the Diocese of Virginia and Washington. You can tell a lot about a church denomination by the kinds of items you find in vesting rooms used by those who serve at the altar in church services. In the Lutheran church, there's often a picture of Martin Luther on the wall. In the Catholic Church, there's always a picture of the ever-blessed Virgin Mary. And in the Episcopal Church, you will always find a full-length mirror. <laughs> it's true. Check it out. <laughs> to be both in inviting, invited and inviting, and welcoming and receiving, well, that is the nature of our church. At least we certainly hope that it is, right? I have witnessed this repeatedly and I know this to be true. By God's grace through the waters of holy baptism, we have each been invited, welcomed and received and now have a place at the banquet table of the Lord. And when the power of that same spirit, humility, and mutual love continue among us, the church can be more inviting still. So let's quickly review what we heard from Holy Scriptures today. In the reading from Jeremiah, God, who has been faithful in leading Israel through the wilderness into a good land, calls upon the heavens to witness the incredible foolishness of a people who, under the flawed leadership of priests, rulers, and prophets, willingly abandon God's life-giving water for leaky cisterns. The conclusion of the letter of the Hebrews contains suggestions for the conduct of a holy life, all of which are shaped by God's love towards us in Jesus Christ. This is our, is our last week hearing from Hebrews, which is a letter about incompletion, indeed for people who were feeling stuck. It speaks to the character and nature of faith and it encourages us, don't give up on community. And in the gospel from Luke, Jesus observes guests jockeying for a position at the table. He uses this as an opportunity to teach his hearers to choose humility rather than self-exaltation. Jesus also makes an appeal for hosts to mimic God's gracious hospitality to the poor and the broken. With all the technological advances and generational disconnects that have occurred in our culture over the past century, it is quite possible that the passing down of wise, honored, time-tested virtues and values is in danger of becoming a lost art. Virtues such as humility, respect for our elders, hospitality to strangers, servanthood to all peoples, and making peace, making peace as well as some good old-fashioned common sense thrown in there to boot. It can all get lost in the missteps and miscommunications that accompany generational shifts in focus and attitude. Jesus likely saw these same things happening in his travels. It's not unique just to our time. He then lifted up the mysteriously gracious and life-transforming values of the kingdom of God. Imagine the humility it would require taking the lowest seat at a grand affair, as well as the degree of hospitality it would take to offer a banquet for what Matthew calls the least of these, 
who Luke identifies as the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. These qualities are examples of the kind of radical yet relational love that we as disciples of Jesus Christ are called to understand, to embody, and to pass down to our descendants. Jesus seems to be changing all the usual rules of behavior, inverting some of the so social norms that are so deeply established. He is suggesting that the rule of life is love, not law. The verses skipped today was the gospel lesson of last week, when you might remember the lawyers and Pharisees were concerned primarily about keeping the law. Jesus reminded them that they would not hesitate to help a suffering donkey or a tired ox on the Sabbath. A child of God is of much greater value. According to Jewish rules, you could help someone on the Sabbath only if their life was threatened. The woman who was so severely bent out of shape that she couldn't look another person in the eye was not in any mortal danger. But Jesus' healing that cured her spiritual curvature of the spine was his teaching that rules are secondary to the well-being of God's children. Today, Jesus is reversing the usual rules governing social situations. He seems to be saying that humility is more important than to be esteemed. When you go to a party, take the less prestigious seat and let your host elevate you. This is a shocking turnabout for most who aspire to places of honor. Yet Jesus goes on to suggest that we invite the very people to our parties who are unable to invite us back. There should be no thought of reciprocity. We who are citizens of the kingdom of God are to do the magnanimous thing without any quid pro quo attitudes. After all, that's what God does for us. The usual law of life is to use our invitation and our social power to make friends, to build networks, and to acquire prestige. In the Roman Empire, who you knew dictated how powerful you might be in business or religion or politics. Not much different than what we see in our own society today, is it? We want to accumulate acquaintances and contacts, those who can enhance our social and our business status. Five years ago, my wife Chrissy and I attended the bishop's clergy spouse lay leaders conference at Shrinemont when Rachel Held Evans was the keynote speaker. People familiar with Rachel? A few. Rachel was an American Christian columnist, a blogger, and an author. Several of her books were on the New York Times bestseller list. Consequently, she was a much sought after speaker and the Bishop's Conference had its best attendance in a good long while. The hotel room at Shrinemont was packed. I mentioned Rachel because during one of the meals, we were dining with friends that we rarely saw but there was still room at our table. My wife, a huge Rachel Held Evans fan, saw her wandering about with a tray of food, not sure where she might sit to eat. So Chrissy went up to extend an invitation to her for, to join us. Truth be told, the sought after speaker had confessed in her talk the night before that she always hated mealtimes at conferences because she never knew anybody and she felt like she was in middle school again. We didn't invite her to join us for prestige. We invited her to welcome the stranger. And having her with us for breakfast was such a delight. So much more now because sadly, Rachel died two years later following an allergic reaction to medication for an infection. The world and the church miss her voice. In her book, Searching for Sunday, 
loving, leaving, and finding the church, Rachel wrote about this gospel text today. Quote, but the gospel doesn't need a coalition devoted to keeping the wrong people out. It needs a family of sinners saved by grace, committed to tearing down the walls, throwing open the doors and shouting, welcome. That's bread and wine. Come and eat with us and talk. This isn't a kingdom for the worthy. It's a kingdom for the hungry. The church is God saying, I'm throwing a banquet and all these mismatched, messed up people are invited. Here, have some wine, unquote. Well, I will tell you, having had just a short breakfast with her, Rachel most definitely knew how to describe the kingdom of God. Now the sermon connection to the joke that I started with is that humility, while being a prized quality in life, is hard because there is so much we hope for us to be proud about. We certainly want to look good. We want to have satisfying jobs. We appreciate earning a good living that allows for lovely homes and nice cars. We want the best for our kids and hope that others acknowledge our accomplishments. As you know, the Episcopal Church is known for its somewhat lavish clergy vestments. That calls for that full-length mirror in the vesting sacristy. But Jesus is ready to remind us of it's the meek in heart and humble in character who find God's love most in the world. Let me put this in other words, which are grace and gratitude. Grace and gratitude is a powerful expression of thanksgiving among many Christian communities. I was taught it, especially at Emmanuel Church on the Hill when I was there five years. I have been with many who regularly gave thanks for many gifts that were shared through self, service, and or substance, which we sometimes know as time, talent, and treasure. The regular use of this expression has remained with me as I have memories of all that I have learned from those friends about grace, gratitude, humility, and hospitality. Most Episcopal priests serve several months post-ordination as a deacon. I remember it as a time to get my bearings as a new kind of liturgical minister. Being a deacon is to practice humility and hospitality. That's what we do. When I was ordained a priest, that humility was accompanied by such delight and immense joy. If I doubted the Lord's wisdom in calling me, and at times I still do, I receive affirmations one after another as I continue to grow as a sacramental agent working for the kingdom of God here on earth. Grace and gratitude keeps me humble not seeking the seed of prestige, but reaching out to others through the many ministries that all of the parishes I have served, including here at St. Margaret's Woodbridge, chose choose to offer and share. I remain so grateful for the many ministers, both lay and ordained, who taught me how to claim my own ministry I am excited for you here at St. Margaret's as you're ready to call and welcome your new clergy as priest in charge. That's grace and gratitude, friends. It is my honor to join with you today for this holy meal around this table that welcomes all of us. May we approach it and one another in a spirit of grace and gratitude and with humility and hospitality as our Lord Jesus Christ exhorts and exalts all of us to be one people in the kingdom of God who are always welcome at this banquet table. Amen. Amen.